here's a different type of a column. A caryatid is a column made to look like a statue. And here we have a little porch on a temple entirely supported by caryatids. They're female figures. If it were a male figure, it would be called a telamon. It's just another name, sometimes called an atlas also, but telamon is uh, the name that more or less is the male version of the caryatid. So this is a fourth type of a column, if you want to think about it that way. Greek influences and architectural elements in modern times. This actually isn't a very modern building. This is called the Villa Rotonda, and it comes from the 16th century, a time when some of these older Greek forms were being revived. Here's some influences of the Greeks on modern architecture. First of all, columns with bases and these capitals, either Doric, Ionic, as you see here, or Corinthian. A triangular-shaped roof like this. However, these are not acroteria. These statues are something from a later age. The Greeks didn't put statues at those points on the roof. And symmetrical openings with an ornamental roof, like a symmetrical opening, one on that side, one on this side, with a little bit of a roof like this that sort of hints to the main roof here. Let's take a look at this figure 61 from the Story of Art, a piece of a frieze from a Greek temple. It's a female figure, but the face has been eroded off here. But what we're looking at is the way this drapery is shaped over the arm and shaped over this leg and hangs here in probably what would be a very realistic way. It certainly seems to be that way. Somebody has had to observe this in the way that the drapery falls here. Another very subtle feature, though, you can see in this area here the hint of the shape of a leg. So this very subtle shaping of the hanging cloth is something that gives a great deal of artistry to this type of a, a figure, something that we really hadn't seen prior to this time, this time of the Greeks in the couple of hundred years before, uh, before Christ. Certainly the earlier forms of uh, statuary inherited from the Egyptians were much more crude. And here's Praxiteles, is the sculptor of this, but Hermes, one of the Greek gods, carved in marble. And this might or may not be an original, it might be a copy, and part of it having broken off here this arm, because of course it's being stoned, some member out here with an arm, uh, it's going to test the strength of the stone to be able to stand it, and it broke off in this case. You see the musculature of the, of the body, you see here the way that the knees are treated and the way that the ankles are treated, very realistic looking, and the way that this cloth is being draped here, and then this, this other little figure, we can't see too much of the artistry of that. Once again, though, keep in mind that working in stone, just a statue like this might have been rather difficult to support on narrow ankles like this. So that's why the sculptor had to put in something here that the statue appeared to be leaning on, and even this connection between the body and this, which is sort of standing out a bit artificially, but it's necessary in order to make the stone strong enough to persevere. Now, here's a comparison between Greek art 600 BC and Greek art only a few hundred years later, and the difference is really very stark. To have come from this sort of a caricature of a human face to a very realistic look of a human face, and the other elements of the body being sort of, you can tell it's a human, but it looks like a robot, and here it looks very much like a living, breathing person. So the Greeks really reached a peak of artistry in a very short time. Sad to say that artistry was lost when the Romans uh, took over the Greek world. They had a more practical purpose for much of their art. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Here the Greeks looked like they were just trying to exemplify beauty and doing this sheer for the purpose of sheer enjoyment, or in some cases to perhaps honor mythological figures. And another example, Apollo Belvedere, this being a copy, the original might have even been in metal, no longer exists. And here you see the same issue of the draping of cloth over an arm, once again the stone having been broken off at this point. It does in fact look like, perhaps even in carving this, it was multiple pieces of stone put together, and the other pieces are no longer there. Once again, the support here, because the statue by itself might have been unstable, or perhaps the thought that uh, 
weak points like this would have broken were it not for some additional support. And Venus de Milo uh, looked like actually a pair of statues was probably involved here and maybe arms outstretched like this and another statue, but the ravages of time have taken their toll. And here's an interesting thing. Alexander the Great, of course, a great Greek hero, conquered much of the Mediterranean area, brought it under Greek control in a, a few hundred years before Christ. The idea here, though, is, uh, of course, this statue may have been much more vivid at the time, painted with various kinds of colors, but the expression is always kind of uh, withdrawn. Uh, not much emotion being shown here because one of the concepts of that day was that emotion would detract from the shape of the face. It might distort things. The eyes look very shallow, very hollow here because, of course, in some statues, this being a copy, in some of the actual statues, these would have been filled in with precious stones to make them look much more like eyes. I think you saw an example of that in a metal statue in the prior chapter. As the Hellenistic period that is, the third period of Greek art moved on, Greek art became very dramatic. And in this case, this altar of Zeus at Pergamon, we have here an interesting piece of artwork, this rather large frieze area, sitting on a pedestal, but next to a set of steps. And for dramatic effect, what's happened here is that the artist who created this sometimes shallow relief, but these things seem to be popping out of the wall, and in this case a very clever effect spilling out onto the steps. Now, of course, if these steps weren't here, you wouldn't get that same effect, but you might be walking up these steps, and it's as if you're being crowded out here a bit by these very dramatic images that are popping out of the wall and even resting on these very same steps. Here we see another example, and the pronunciation of this name, Hagesandros, follows Greek pronunciation rules, but it isn't the way I'd like to pronounce it. I'll call it Hegesandros, just to follow those rules. This word being even stranger, in terms of an English word, is pronounced Leakuan. Leakuan. This is a very famous group of uh, that was lost actually until the 1500s, and when it was discovered it caused a big stir because the Renaissance was underway, and this looked like quite a dramatic piece of artwork from the ancient world, rediscovered after much more than a thousand years of being hidden. What's happening here is, as the Greeks were coming up with the Trojan horse to the city of Troy to attempt to conquer it, this priest in Troy apparently figured out what was going on with the Trojan horse, that it was full of Greek soldiers, and he wanted to prevent that horse from coming into the city. But the gods actually wanted that to happen. They wanted to see Troy punished. And so they sent these snakes, these big sea snakes here, out to kill the priest and his two sons, who both knew the secret as well. So here you see this writhing and this very dramatic appearance of people being killed. Here the snake is even biting the man's hip and being strangled like some boa constrictors here, just wrapping themselves around and killing these people. And they're in anguish and suffering. Their outcome is pretty well understood to be fatal. So the drama in this, why did they create this? Well, probably for entertainment purposes, and maybe even at this point in, in Greek uh, sculpture, uh, purely for dramatic effect, to dramatize something that would have been a very high-impact scene, and to do it in such a way that would show off as much artistry as possible with the way these bodies are contorted but represented very realistically, and all these muscles straining against these these very powerful snakes.